Good morning and happy Easter to you. I know that this Easter is very different than probably most of the Easter's that you've experienced in your life. I know that on most Easter's we gather together as a church. I know that our churches are normally filled and our campuses are packed and we're excited about being able to gather together and celebrate Jesus's resurrection. But this Sunday is different because of the circumstances in our world right now because of social distancing, we're not able to meet together. And for some of us, that may cause Easter to be a sad day. I hope that you'll be encouraged this morning and not be sad by the fact that Jesus is risen. He is alive. He has been resurrected. And whether we can meet together or whether we have to tune in online to hear a sermon in our houses, that fact doesn't change. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is alive, and everything he accomplished is still true. I also want you to think about this point on Easter, this highly unusual Easter Sunday. The disciples, as we're going to see in just a moment, we're going to look at John chapter 20. The disciples on that first Easter were in a house, and they were in a locked room, gathered together. They were fearful. They were grieving. They were anxious. There were doubts in their heart. And I know that in some way we can relate to that. And this Easter Sunday, as we are in our own houses with, with doubt and fear and anxiety about what's going to come, we can relate to what the disciples experienced. And this may be the first Easter in our lives that is really closest to what the disciples felt on that first Easter Sunday. So in the midst of everything going on, God laid this message on my heart. I want to share with you from John chapter 20, verse 19. I'll read verses 19 uh, and 20, but we're mainly going to be in verse 19. And it's about Jesus coming into the midst of the disciples and declaring his peace to them. And I've titled this message, Peace from Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The peace that comes from Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, turn them with me, turn in them with me to John chapter 20. And we're going to read verses 19 and 20 together. When it was evening of the first day of that week, the disciples were gathered together and they had the doors locked because they were afraid of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for another Easter Sunday that we get to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. Thank you, God, for Jesus, your son, who came and died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected from the grave on the third day. Jesus didn't stay dead. He's alive. And we're so thankful for that. And Jesus, thank you for the promise that we have that when we trust in you, because you were resurrected, one day we will be too. Lord Jesus, as we speak about your peace this morning, I pray that you would bring your peace to our hearts. I pray that you would come to wherever each one is, Lord Jesus, as they need your peace, as they may ask for your peace. And I pray, Jesus, that you would come just as you did with the disciples on that resurrection day, that you would come into their midst and you would declare your peace to them. Lord, there may be some who are watching this message who've never trusted in you as their Savior. They've never experienced your peace before, and they desperately want it and desperately need it. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come and you would give them their peace, that they would cry out to you in faith and put their faith and trust in you, and they would experience your peace for the first time. Lord Jesus, please speak to us through your word, and may your truth stir our hearts and change us. Make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wanted to start out this morning by talking to you about peace. And I looked up a definition of what peace is. This is a definition I got off of uh, Google's dictionary. And it says this, freedom from disturbance. So peace is freedom from disturbance. And I got to thinking, there are two different types of disturbances we have in our life that we can categorize everything into. One is outside disturbances. You know, when you hear the beauty pageant answer of what would you like to see happen in the world? Well, I want peace on earth. Really what we're talking about is outside disturbance, 
Peace from outside disturbance. Peace from war. Peace from violence. Those are outside disturbances. And when we talk about peace, we can talk about it in those terms. But there's another type of peace that we get. And that's peace from internal or inside disturbances. That's the peace we get from the thoughts of our heart and our mind, the anxieties and the worries that we have. And really, as humans, we desire peace. We want peace from outside. We want external peace. And we want peace on the inside. We want internal peace. There was a famous quote. You've probably heard it before. It originated during World War II. Many think it came from the Battle of Bataan in the Philippines. And it says this, There are no atheists in foxholes. No atheists in foxholes. Why is that? Because all of us want peace. And especially in times of suffering, this quote, uh, you know, in, in times of war, when shells are being fired and exploding overhead and around you, then prayers go up. When suffering comes, our desire for peace comes to the forefront and it grows even stronger. What happens is we begin as a people, we begin to lift our eyes back to heaven. Prayers begin to go up again. They increase in frequency. Bible sales go up. Churches become full. You know, this is where we find the disciples in John chapter 20, verse 19. The doors were locked and they were fearful. And they desperately in their hearts needed peace. They wanted peace. They wanted peace externally. They wanted peace internally. They're grieving. They're scared. Their world has been turned upside down. Because the fact is, at this point, before Jesus comes and appears to them, Jesus is dead. They think he's gone. They think he's dead. And I was reading in Reverend James Stalker's book, The Life of Christ, and he made this quote. He said, there was not a single person on earth in that time that thought Jesus was going to be resurrected before judgment day. They thought when Jesus was taken down off that cross and his body was put in the tomb, that was it. One day at judgment day, when the final resurrection happened, Jesus would raise just like any other man. He would be resurrected, but not until then. So not a single disciple expected him to be resurrected. They thought it was all over. They thought everything was lost. The Jews had come after their Lord and their master, Jesus, and they had succeeded and crucifying him and killing him. Maybe John, who wrote the Gospel of John, he was the only disciple that we have recorded that was at the cross. He tells us he was there. And maybe as John is standing at the foot of the cross, watching his Savior suffer and die, maybe John thought, maybe at the last minute, Jesus is going to come in his glory. He's going to perform some miracle and bring himself down off the cross. That's what the people passing by were yelling up at him. He saved others. Let him save himself. If you really are the son of God, come off the cross. Maybe John thought he would. Everything was lost. It was all over. Even God seemed silent to them. John, who was standing at the foot of the cross, and the other women who were there, as they were looking to Jesus, as John was hoping that maybe at the last moment Jesus would perform a miracle. What did he hear instead? Jesus got to the point and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm sure that statement stuck in John's mind and his heart. And when he gathered with the other disciples, maybe he even shared that with them and said, Hey, not only is all hope lost, God has even forsaken Jesus. And we all know what kind of man Jesus was. We all know the relationship that he had with God. And if God has forsaken him, then surely God has forsaken us. Jesus is gone. The Jews are after us. And even God is silent. If God had forsaken Jesus, what hope did the disciples have? They were in the very depths of grief and despair. There was no peace outside of themselves. There was no external peace. They had the doors locked. They were afraid that the Jews and Romans would come for them next. There was no peace inside. There was no internal peace. Everything seemed lost. Hope seemed dead. Jesus was gone. Everything 
that they had committed themselves to, everything that they had worked towards was gone. The past three years of their life was wasted. I wonder if you've ever been in this place before, if you've ever felt despair, no peace outside, no peace inside. You might even feel that way now. You may be struggling with the events going on and as there's no peace in the world, there's no peace inside of you. But here's the good news. God is not dead. God is not silent. He's not forsaken us. Jesus is alive. Jesus is risen. And you can have his peace. Look at verse 19. When it was evening the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. And Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. I really believe as I read this and we look elsewhere in Scripture at how God works in us, in his people, in the midst of suffering. I believe that God had brought the disciples to a place through suffering where they could only depend on him. They were crushed. They were despondent. They were helpless and hopeless. And I believe that God had brought them to this place. God had so crushed them that their only hope was for him. They could only look to him for salvation. Even if they didn't know it yet, even if they thought God had forsaken them. But really, God was preparing their hearts to rejoice in Jesus. He was preparing them to be able to receive Jesus as Jesus came in all of his glory as the resurrected Son of God. See, God uses suffering to refocus his people's eyes and hearts on him. Proverbs 17.3 says this, A crucible is for silver, a smelter is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. See, a crucible is what a blacksmith might use, and they would pour the silver with all of its impurities into that crucible, and then the blacksmith would take it and hold it on a pole in the fire, and he would watch that crucible in the fire, and he would keep his eye on it, because at the exact moment that the impurities bubbled up in that silver from the heat, the heat would make those impurities come out of that silver to leave pure silver there. As soon as the impurities would come up, he would take an instrument and scrape the impurities off and the silver could come out of the fire. And that's what Solomon in Proverbs is saying here. Just like the blacksmith may put a crucible in the fire to get the impurities out of the silver, God tests our hearts. How does he test our hearts? Through trials, through suffering, through times when we might be tempted to despair, through times when we might be tempted to be anxious. Hebrews 12, 7 says this, endure suffering as discipline. Remember, God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? What he's saying is when you go through suffering, when you go through a trial, you're to think of it as a child of God, as a time of discipline. And discipline is there for our correction. Uh, Hebrews 12, 11 says this, No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. None of us want to be disciplined. None of us enjoy the discipline that comes. It's painful at the time, but later as we look back, we see that it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness and we see that God was training us through that time of discipline. And later the disciples will be able to look back and they'd say, remember how we were in despair, but Jesus came into our midst. And when we saw that he had been resurrected, oh, the peace that came into our hearts, oh, the joy that filled us. Just just days later, as Jesus would be there about 40 days with them and reveal himself to others. And then he, when he ascended back into heaven and the disciples received the Holy Spirit, they began to preach at Pentecost. And what you saw at Pentecost was not fearful disciples locked, into it, locked in a room, but you saw men who had been filled with the Holy Spirit, who had joy brought from the risen Savior in their hearts, who had a mission from Jesus. They were telling everybody about the resurrected Lord Jesus. Jesus changed everything when he came to them and declared his peace to them. I believe that God is using this time in our lives 
to make us dependent on him again. And I just have been praying that God would work in me and God would revive my heart and my faith and God would work and do whatever he needs to do in me to prepare him for the future work that he has in me. I pray that God would, would use me and, and work in me during this time. It will be a time of preparation. and He would make me fix my eyes on him and my heart on him. So in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their despair, Jesus comes to them and he brings them his peace. In the middle of their fear, in the middle of their grief, in the middle of their sheltering in place, if you want to say that, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. We have to know a couple of reasons why he came and says, peace be with you. One is, it tells us in the Gospel of Luke that when Jesus appears in their midst, remember the doors are locked, and Jesus in his resurrection body, we don't know exactly how he did it, but we just know this, that one moment Jesus wasn't there and the next he was. He didn't open the door. He didn't come through the door. He was just there in their midst. The locked doors couldn't keep him out. And when he appears, it says in Luke that the disciples thought he was a ghost. So one of the reasons why he says peace is because they're immediately afraid. And it also tells us in Luke that after Jesus speaks to them, he asks them for some fish so that they see him eat and see that he's not a ghost, that this really is Jesus in his physical body there with them. Another thing he does, we read in verse 20, is he shows them his hands and his side to prove that, yes, he is Jesus. So they rejoiced when they saw him. That's one way that he says, peace be with you. Here's the next. The other reason he declares peace to them is this. He's not wishing them peace, but he's declaring his peace to them. Listen to these two quotes. One is from, uh, the first is from G. Campbell Morgan. It says that Jesus had faced and defeated all the forces which destroy the peace of man. So as he said, peace be with you, he was doing infinitely more than expressing a wish. He was making a declaration. He was bestowing a benediction. He was imparting a blessing. David Gizek says it this way, my sins are forgiven, peace. My slavery to sin is broken, peace. My Savior takes my fears and my cares, peace. My life is settled for eternity, peace. See, when Jesus came and he said, peace be with you, on, on one hand, on one level, he wants them to know he's not a ghost, don't be afraid. But on an infinitely, eternally more important level, he wants them to understand that he has secured eternal peace. The peace that Jesus gives is eternal peace with God. And yes, the disciples didn't fully recognize this yet, but Jesus comes having defeated death, having defeated sin, having accomplished everything he needed to on the cross. Remember, right before he died, what did Jesus say? He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. He said it is finished because he had secured eternal peace with God for all who believe in him. It tells us in Romans chapter five, verse one. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus died for our sins and took his sin, excuse me, took our sin on himself and gave us his righteousness, we have peace with God. Romans 5, 10 says this, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made Jesus who did not know sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Remember when Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane? Remember his prayer? He said, Lord, all things are possible for you. If it's your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. What cup is he talking about? He's talking about the cup of God's wrath that's mentioned all throughout the Old Testament. It's the cup of God's holy wrath that is reserved for all sinners who've sinned against him. And when Jesus goes to the cross and 
faces this horrible death of crucifixion, which was one of the most horrific ways in history to die. He's, he's worried about that, but even more than that, he's concerned, he's worried. He's, his, he said his soul is grieved to the point of death. Why? Because of this cup of God's wrath, where God would make Jesus become sin for us. Jesus took all of my sin on himself and he paid the punishment. He drank the cup of God's wrath down to the last drop. All God's wrath was poured out on him so that in turn, I could no longer be seen as a sinner, but Jesus could give me his righteousness, his perfect life, his perfect obedience to God's law that I could never measure up to. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57 says this. Because Jesus accomplished everything that God sent him to do on the cross, because he secured peace with God through us, we can now say this, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, where death is your victory, where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God because he has given us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death no longer has victory over us. Sin no longer has power over us. Death's sting was taken away when Jesus was resurrected from the grave because Jesus secured victory. He secured peace with us and God. See, all peace, all peace flows from eternal peace with God. That's why Paul is able to write Philippians 4, 6 through 7. He says this to the Philippian church, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus made peace with God for us so that we can come to him and, and be forgiven of our sin. We no longer have to face the wrath of God. And what that means is not only our eternal redemption, our eternal security, but it means that the peace of God can guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And what is he talking about? The context of Philippians 4, 6, and 7, he's talking about all the different circumstances we face in this life. So Jesus' peace gives us peace with God for eternity, but that peace with God from, for eternity flows into all areas and aspects and circumstances of our life. Because we have peace for eternity, we can have peace now. That's why Peter is able to write 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on Jesus because he cares about you. Jesus takes away my cares. Jesus takes away my worries. Jesus takes away my anxieties because he dealt with my sin. He took away my sin. These verses are not possible without peace from Jesus. But Jesus gives us peace. So as I close, I want to ask you this question. Do you have Jesus' peace? Do you know the peace that Jesus gives? If you don't have peace with God in Jesus, you will never have peace. You will never find it anywhere else. Yes, you may feel peaceful temporarily, but what will happen is you'll try to get your peace. You'll try to derive your peace from outward circumstances. And then when everything outwardly, when the world begins to suffer, when things go wrong, there will be no peace within. But if you have peace with God in Jesus within that peace flows into every other circumstance of your life. Listen, you need to know this. Jesus will give you his peace right now. He'll give you his peace immediately. When you place your faith in Jesus, you receive his peace immediately. I remember the moment that I experienced Jesus' peace, and I experienced it immediately. I was 11 years old. It was right after September 11th. September 11th was the event that God used to stir my heart and to show me that I did not have the peace that I needed. There was a fear that gripped my heart because I knew I was without peace. And my father recognized that. My father shared the gospel with me again. I heard it in my heart for the first time. I realized that I needed Jesus and I needed a relationship 
with him. I needed his love and his peace. And I cried out to Jesus in faith and I said, Jesus, I need you to save me. I need you. I'm a sinner. And I need you as my Lord and my Savior. And as soon as I believed that in my heart, it wasn't the words I said. It was, it was me believing that in my heart. As soon as I placed my faith in him, I immediately experienced his peace. That is the greatest night's sleep I've ever had in my life. I've had really good night's sleep since then, and I always am able to rest my head, as my father-in-law says, on a soft pillow because of Jesus. But that first night, it was special because that night I experienced Jesus' peace for the first time. So if you're watching this and you do not have Jesus' peace, all you have to do is cry out to him like I did and like so many others have over the ages of history and say, Jesus, I need you. Save me from my sins. If you know Jesus and you need his peace, maybe your mind has felt distracted and it's been all over the place. I just want to share with you Isaiah chapter 23. Excuse me, Isaiah 26, verse 3. I read this this morning. God brought it to my mind. Isaiah 26, verse 3 says this. You will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace. For it is trusting in you. Trust in the Lord forever because in the Lord, the Lord himself is an everlasting rock. Jesus brings us peace. And I just want to encourage you to place your mind on him. Place your mind on him and your heart on him and trust in him by spending time in his word. It's really easy for us to trust in all sorts of different things we may hear. And, and I find myself doing it too. I want to find hope in the latest news report or in the latest update. But where we get our hope is in God's word. So take some time. Go to God's word and say, God, help me to trust you. Help me to focus on you. Focus on you. Help me to put my trust in you. And I pray that you would do what your word says and you will give me peace. Help my mind to focus on you. I pray that this Easter Sunday will be a time where you can remember that Jesus was resurrected. Jesus died for our sins, but he didn't stay dead. Jesus rose from the grave on the third day. And he did it to bring us peace with God and to bring us his love and his joy. And you can have that love and that joy today. Let me pray for us as we close. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus and the love that we have in Jesus and the peace that we have in Jesus. And Father, I just pray that right now where each one may be watching this video, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would work in their hearts through the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak to them, show them um, if, if they're in you, Jesus, or if not. If they don't know your peace, I pray that right now you'd lead them to just place their faith in Jesus. Jesus, if they are found in you, I pray that you would give them your peace. You would guard their mind and their heart with your peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord Jesus, help us to trust you. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to love you and serve you. And God, I pray that you would prepare us, that these would be days of preparation where your grace makes us strong and that, Lord Jesus, you would use us for your glory and for your good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.